Are we live? Welcome to the final 2024 Annie Kincaid Warfield Lecture, the last of six. Phil Ziegler, professor of Christian dogmatics at Aberdeen at this point, uh, needs no introduction. He's taken us along on a wild ride over this week. Um, I've been particularly impressed how he has demonstrated to us um, I hope you don't mind me saying this, a very, uh, it's coming from, you know, I was trained by Michael Velker, so in his mouth, this, this was a prime example of biblical theology is, I think, a form of praise, right? The theological reflection in response to and in continued conversation with and in ongoing accountability to the biblical text. Um, you've also displayed to us this wonderful exemplary form of systematic theology of a mapping of concepts that both utilize and also expand our inherited grammars um, as it stands um, at the intermediate point between the text that we're accountable to and the context that we're also called to speak into and be accountable to. And then thirdly, I was just so impressed by the pedagogy that you've also employed as you have resisted not just the reductionist uh, readings, but also the premature revelations and <laughs> Um, gone with us uh, almost fiendishly, you know, anticipating these questions that come up, but not yet delivering, um, taking us on to this whole journey. But before we now finally uh, confront the devil in our doctrine, as the uh, title of the last lecture is, I want to give you a small token of our resonance with your talk, uh, because, you know, in New Jersey, we also know something about the devil. <laughs> who is said to haunt the pine barrens, and who is not always our adversary, not even God's and not also always ours, but sometimes also a guardian or a mascot or representative figure. Um, and so since I've gathered that as a scholar, you appreciate the devil, and as a Canadian, you appreciate hockey, and as I've learned that you've also um, appreciate puns a token of how much we've resonated <laughs> with your talk here. Thank you. And now, Dr. Phil Ziegler on the devil in our doctrine. That's great. I've been waiting for six lectures to get a devil's joke in there, and I haven't been able to do it. So anyway, thank you. That's very thoughtful indeed. I shall wear it with great pride. Okay, lecture six, here we are. Um, there's a handout. Uh, this time it does tell you a little more about what's coming. So um, uh, just three parts this evening. Um, part, part two, um, uh, some theses about the devil, um, the, the heart of the matter. Um, this evening our, we, we have an epigraph from Pascal. Um, For Jesus Christ worked against the devil and destroyed his power over hearts, of which exorcism is the figure to establish the kingdom of God. So welcome back uh, to this, the final lecture in the series. Let me uh, remind us briefly where we've been together this week. Having in the first lecture tried to motivate interest in the devil as a theme for reformed theology on cultural and ecumenical and biblical grounds, my second lecture sketched something of the career of the devil in Christian theology in the West. It set out what I call the majority report uh, which from the time of Augustine up into the modern period fixed the default dogmatic location of, of diabology in the first article of the creed. Its fundamental framing doctrines, angelology, primitive evil, and providence, 
and its recurrent preoccupations, refuting dualism, refusing moral exculpation for sin, and so on. Uh, in isolation from the doctrines of salvation uh, in this way, and under pressures both rational and exegetical, the, the doctrine finally gave way for many in the modern period as an unnecessary and troublesome legacy. I suggested uh, in that second lecture, though, that there were, uh, uh, were also intimations of another approach to the doctrine, visible, for example, in some of the early informative catechetical texts of the Reformed churches, an approach which placed it not in the first article, but rather close to the heart of the doctrine of salvation, and so connected it first and foremost with the substance and concerns of the second article of the Creed, soteriology. Associating myself with this minority report, I then proposed to undertake a little experiment in alternative diabology. And to this end, the third and the fourth and the fifth lectures went in search of the devil, as it were. Um, spying him in particular on the pages of the Gospels, we met and contemplated him there as the worker of his works, the intractable antagonist of the Christ. The lectures built up a kind of profile of the devil in negative relief by attending to the form and the dynamism of this enmity to the person and work of Christ as uh, in, in the shaping structure of the talk, the way and the life and the truth. This threefold characterization of Christ organized matters and illumined a threefold antagonism to the work of saving grace, made concretely manifest in diabolical temptation, demonic possession, and devilish deceit. In this way, we contemplated what one theologian, I think quite aptly, has described as the extreme crystallization of the demonic precisely in contrast to the figure of Christ. Questions of the identity, agency, and ontology of the devil have been broached along the way, and I suggested that descriptions like adventitious, adversarial, and anarchistic might afford some purchase on the devil's rather peculiar figure. More about these matters in a moment. Each lecture also touched briefly upon some ways in which our thinking about the devil in this way provided new and perhaps interesting perspectives upon some aspects of prayer and the practices of the Christian life. Approaching matters in this way, we've tried throughout, precisely as an exercise in Reformed theology, to expose our thinking afresh to the lively biblical testimony from which it ultimately derives and for whose force and form it looks to take intellectual responsibility in the present. In this last lecture, then, I want to consider directly some theological matters arising from all of this and to venture some claims about the devil in our doctrine. These claims must be fitted to the nature of our experiment and its brevity. None are hard deductions. Most will take the form of summary restatements, conceptual inferences, inductive extensions. Though expressed as propositions, the tone throughout will be, as you'll notice, tentative, the mood frequently subjunctive, might, could, should, maybe. I think that's appropriate because we are, after all, thinking about a mystery inside a mystery. The mysterium iniquitatis from within the mysterium evangelii, the problem of evil inside the mystery of the gospel. Donald McKinnon, who I invoked earlier uh, for other reasons, usefully reminds us uh, of this point in this way. He writes, it's a lesson to be learnt from tragedy, he's thinking about Greek tragedy there, that there is no solution to the problem of evil. It is a lesson which Christian faith abundantly confirms, even while it transforms the teaching by indication of its central mystery. In the cross, he continues, the conflicting claims of truth and mercy are reconciled by deed and not by word. The manner of their reconciliation is something which lies beyond the frontier of our comprehension, we can only describe and re-describe. The patron of this lectureship, B.B. Warfield himself, when he sought to describe and re-describe that saving deed, rightly emphasized both its divine quality and its costliness. Those were his great themes. In describing and re-describing that same deed with specific reference to, to the devil, these lectures have called particular attention to its agonistic and its redemptive quality, so its agonism, and redemption. And thus, I hope encouraged us to think a little differently about the truth and the mercy of God enacted in Jesus Christ. We have, in a way, been asking how these crucial themes, the truth and mercy of God in the figure of Christ, might be seen differently, might appear to us in new ways 
when we firmly acknowledge, as Emil Werner once wrote, that in the New Testament witness, the background provided by the existence of the powers of darkness, however they may be, con be conceived, is integral, his word, integral to the story of Jesus Christ. So with that, on to section two, some theses about the devil. Already with these introductory remarks, I've begun to take stock of some of the theological yield of reconsidering the devil with firm and consistent reference to the person and work of the Savior. Allow me to try to collect my further remarks about this yield under four headings, and you'll, you'll see these listed on the outline. So number one, dogmatic location and ordering. That sounds really boring when I read that, uh, but it's not because our first claim is that the doctrine of the devil does actually belong logically and theologically to the second article of the creed. The dramatic role of the devil is, we might say, expressed with maximum compression in the Apostles' Creed when that creed says that Jesus suffered. The whole course of Christ's life and ministry, everything which he underwent between his birth and his death, sub Pontio Pilato, is there encompassed and included in that one word. Without excluding suffering in a narrower sense, the meaning of the term is, of course, more capacious, meaning underwent or endured all that he underwent, all that he endured. We have attended to the ways in which the confrontation with the devil as tempter and usurper and liar is integral to the gospel telling of the way of the Messiah to the cross. This confrontation and this struggle is ingredient in his activity and therefore ingredient in his identity as the Savior. He is Christ Jesus agonistus. His life and work as Savior is a three-agent drama from start to finish. I wonder now if the gospel can be heard as the good news that it is without recognition of this fact. In the account that I'm proposing, the devil does not appear in the beginning, but in the middle. The devil makes his evangelical appearance in media res. We speak of the devil here in giving an account of the actual state of affairs which the saving advent of Christ brings to light. Walter Sparn is thus right to say that Christian talk of the devil becomes meaningful only within the horizon provided by the proclamation of the gospel of salvation. But we can be even more precise than this. The devil appears as a topic in and belongs to our contemplation of the outworking of, sal of salvation in virtue of what Calvin called the whole course of Christ's obedience. This, I suggest, is its native province the dogmatic locus where it proves both concrete and therefore consequential. A key feature of this soteriological framing is a recognition that the profile of the devil takes shape and is glimpsed only in its close and concrete contact with Christ. The devil is manifest first and foremost, as we've shown, I hope throughout, as anti-Christ, the adversary of Christ, the enemy of the saving transit of the one who is truly God and truly human, the one who comes low for us and for our salvation. The gospel has a derivative, but a real interest in the devil. Derivative, because it meets and thinks of the devil solely as Christ's adversary. Real, because the shape and substance of its primitive testimony suggests that the good news cannot be rightly heard and understood without it. I've said that as strongly as I can. Reformed theologians, perhaps not only them, I think, should be ambitious for our theological thinking to share this biblical attitude toward the devil. One could do this in a variety of ways, of course, but I would suggest that rehousing the devil in the second article of the creed, and so taking Christology and soteriology, soteriology as its most proper and determinative dogmatic location, should mark any such attempt. This is to say that the fundamental shape and the fundamental function of theological talk of the devil ought to be determined primarily in that location, with questions connected to other aspects of doctrine, like the first article concerns about creation and providence, deferred and subordered accordingly. Not ignored, but deferred and subordered accordingly. Thesis two, the encompassing priority of redemption. Our second claim follows, I think, from the first. When we acknowledge that the devil, as Christ's adversary, is a prominent and ubiquitous ingredient in the evangelical testimony to the outworking of salvation, then our understanding of the form and substance of that salvation is itself affected. You can't think about salvation the same way once we've paid attention to this, mo this motif. 
I agree with the Swiss the the theologian Henri Matou that the controlling concern of all Christian theology is, as he puts it, Jesus Christ, his work in person, as the polemical encounter of God's reality with the reality of the world. It's a nice phrase, the polemical encounter of God's reality with the reality of the world. Now, Matou takes the term polemical, in fact, from Bonhoeffer, who in his ethics describes the achievement of salvation as the realization of living and what he calls polemical unity between God and the world that God comes to save, a polemical unity. This way of talking injects a valuable agonistic note into the conception of reconciliation, reminding us that reconciliation involves judgment and forgiveness, which is to say that God moves against sin for the sake of righteousness and the rectification of the world. But our reflections on the devil in these lectures provide perhaps an even more expansive and necessary gloss upon the meaning of the word polemic or polemical in that proposition. As we've seen, Christ's saving confrontation with the devil as tempter and usurper and liar has the form of a sustained polemos, right? a sustained struggle with this world and the ruler of this world, precisely for the sake of this world. One of our poets observes the whole Christian message is therefore permeated with the urgency of rescue. As emerged with particular sh uh, sharpness, perhaps, from our reflections on possession and exorcism, both our misery and our transgressions, both the depletion of our selfhood as well as its titanic inflation, are the object of divine salvation in Christ. Our thinking about the devil has, I hope, helped to bring this full-orbed account of the saving work of Christ back into view. The work of Christ is more expansive than we might otherwise have thought. And not just a full orbed, but also an ordered account. Our thinking about the devil has pushed us to acknowledge the priority of redemption over reconciliation in our soteriological doctrine. That's my claim. This work of salvation, the work of struggle over and against the devil for the sake of the ones to whom he sent, this work of salvation is principally a work of deliverance. It's principally a work of redemption, of liberation. To resist temptation in order to walk the way of the cross as the path of the, of the Messiah, our first mode. To deliver and to repossess the possessed for the sake of life and life abundant, our second mode. And thirdly, to defeat falsehood and betrayal by the enactment of divine and human truth. And to dispel darkness by the advent of light. These are visions of redemption. Redemption addressed to a world under the heel of illicit and oppressive powers a world whose time and space and sociality are and have been organized by death. The problem of reconciliation, of guilt and forgiveness, is properly, in my mind, nested, nested within the more encompassing concern for redemption. It is those who are rescued from the oppressive captivity to powers too strong for us to throw off, who are then, in freedom, confronted with their complicity, and all too willing service to those very captivating powers. Reflecting on the devil and the gospel as we have sets this dynamic before us in a comprehensive and cosmic register, but we can also recognize it as it repeats itself in both social and political and psychological registers as well, without reduction, without reduction. Tearing with the devil as we have these last few days has reminded us not only of the redemptive nature of our salvation, but perhaps also of its depth and its breadth, the depth and breadth of the problem and the depth and breadth of the solution which salvation in Christ brings. When, when we think, as we must, from solution to plight, from the quality of God's saving action in Christ back to the quality of the captivity from which it secures our release, then we are led to acknowledge the radicality of that captivity and the strength of our captor, as it were. We are reminded that salvation is addressed both to our expansive malfeasance and to the depth of our misery. The devil figures, as we've stressed, first and foremost as God's adversary in Christ, and because God's adversary, also then ours. Perhaps it is, as Isaac Dorner once remarked, that one of the tasks of the devil in our doctrine is to supply an account of the nature and the power of evil, which respects precisely this soteriological depth and, as he puts it, resists all volatilization. Finally, having motivated these judgments about, uh, sorry, having motivated these judgments almost exclusively from theological reflection on the Gospels, as we have, 
We might also note at just this point that the three-agent drama of salvation involving God, the human, the anti-God power or powers, appears now not to be merely an idiosyncratic feature of Paul's apocalyptic theology. The exchange of lordships, which according to Kazemon is the hallmark of Pauline soteriology, keeps close company, it seems, with the gospel vision of all four gospels, of the work of the cross as a great exorcism, by means of which the insurgent ruler of this world is driven out, driven out by the Lord. We may also recall here that the great de deliverance of Israel out of Egypt, which is the original source and paradigm of redemption, is itself scripted as a three-agent drama, something which we saw reflected in the Belgic Confession when it drew parallels between Pharaoh and the devil in relation to the meaning of baptism. This may, in fact, provide a key to the wider question about the connection of our theme to the witness of the Old Testament. The Exodus is both prototype and archetype of the three-agent drama of redemption, together with Israel's heated polemics against idolatry, especially when directed inward, importantly, are both more immediately sal salient to a Christian doctrine of the, of the devil, I charge, than the few and isolated appearances of talk of the Satan in the Old Testament text. And, if I were feeling brave, I might suggest even more salient than the book of Job. And with that, moving quickly to section three. <laughs> Part three. Diabolical Identity, Agency, and Ontology. Over the course of the lectures, we've commented on passant about the identity, agency, and ontology of the devil, and it would be apt to try to consolidate what can be said here. The majority tradition, you will recall, answered these kinds of questions about the, uh, the devil's being and activity quite handily. It did that because it was working out of the first article of the creed. The devil is a creature, an angelic creature, who, though fallen, is yet an angel, being, retaining the nature and natural powers of just such a creature, that kind of agent. The primitive, of nature, the primitive nature of evil secures this point time and again. The actions of a fallen angel are and remain angelic in their form, spiritual, rational, non-discursive, non-physical, and so on, and angelic in their force preternatural, if not supernatural. The, the, the devil's willful fall, of course, irrevocably disorders all of this as to its desires and ends, including its ultimate end in God. But the devil is not identical with evil, nor does he become evil without remainder. You remember the point, right? Nothing that is can be evil all the way down, right? To be is to be good, right? Even the devil's uh, uh, being is good right? as part of the creation. All of this, so this majority account here, cast the devil rather as the rebellious creature among rebellious creatures, a first among many, and the chief of sinners. It was possible for the tradition to say quite a bit about the identity and the agency and the ontology of the, of the devil, and to do so with fair confidence, because it had quite a bit to say about angels, having the confidence of its exegesis, of the angelic fall, and also of its metaphysics, angelic or otherwise. But what of us? Having tethered our th thinking firmly to the second article and approached the devil with a keen interest chiefly in his antagonistic contravention of the work of Christ, what might we be able to say about these things? Well, perhaps not nearly so much, and perhaps also without the confidence that the tradition has shown. Yet I have suggested at points that the quality of the devil's being and agency might be characterized chiefly, and these are my three terms again, as adversarial and adventitious and anarchic. Let me say a little bit now about each of those in turn. So adversarial. By characterization of the devil's being as adversarial, I mean to signal that the being of the devil is exclusively in virtue of its antithesis and contradiction of God and God's good purposes and actions. The devil is only because and as he is against God, lacking independent positive existence or grounds for existence. His is a being that is entirely exhausted in its actions, temptation, possession, dissimulation, betrayal, and so on. As the fourth gospel has it, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. The intuition here is that what the primitive account of evil has always said about evil that it, that it is without positive being, 
that it is only as the contradiction of being, and so on, can and should be said about the devil as such, that the interval between evil and the devil should be closed. Implicit in this view is the claim that the devil is not properly conceived of as a creature, angelic or otherwise. We can think about that later on. The term adventitious, my second term, intends to bring just this claim to some kind of expression. It tries to signal that the devil has no proper place, no proper place in either the creation or the new creation, that the devil is ontologically incidental or alien, appearing only as an entirely extraneous factor, something insubstantial yet actual, something that ought not to be yet is. In saying these kinds of things, I've, of course, begun to avail myself of the paradoxical forms of speech, not unlike, perhaps, Barthes' talk of sin and evil as nothingness, or as the impossible possibility, or as a factor which is impossible yet actual, and, of course, the difficult assertion of Barthes cited at the outset of the lectures that demonic action has no ontology. But be that as it may, I might have other friends, too. The pseudo uh, Dionysius once asserted, uh, and I quote him here, that evil is not among the things that have being, nor is it among the things that are not in being. He goes on to say that it has a greater non-existence and otherness from the good than non-being has. It has a greater non-existence and otherness from the good than non-being has. To think of the reality of the devil as one marked by that far greater non-existence and otherness is, I think, the challenge of my lectures. Precisely what I'm calling here the adventitious quality of the diabolical reality is what such awkward forms of speech are intended to pick out. They are ways of gesturing at the weird, again, that technical term, weird ontological status of this antithetical power. It's being neither God nor creature, yet being still. It's being only in its virulent, annihilating relation to what is. Perhaps Paul's talk of the anti-God powers as so-called gods, who are by nature not gods, yet exercise power to subjugate, points to the same kind of puzzling phenomenon. The third term, uh, anarchic, intends to signal that the antithetical agency in which the being of the devil is and is exhausted has no independent aim or end or accountable purpose that its end and end point is always also exhausted in its antithesis and contradiction of God and God's good purposes and acts. It has no independent telos except the contradiction of God. Polish philosopher Leszek uh, Kalikowski expressed this insight rather forcefully when he wrote this. He said, Satan himself only appears where destruction has no purpose, where cruelty and humiliation are perpetuated for their own sake, Death for the sake of death, where suffering is without end, or where the end is only a mask worn to rationalize the hunger for destruction. Only there, however small be the setback to being, does the icy power in fact reveal itself, a power which cannot be reduced to anything, explained by anything, or justified in any way. In sum, what I want to suggest is that something like the privative account of evil might be repurposed repurposed in the more dramatic and dynamic context of the second article of the Creed. Translated here, this privative take uh, acquires a more concrete form as the negation and opposition of the saving work of God in Christ. It names the virulent and vicious enemy of the redemptive work of God. It's from this working that we infer these claims about the nature of its being and action, claims which we might digest into a single claim Namely, that the devil has but an an-ontological, or if you'd rather, an antago-ontological existence. That is an inelegant neologism, if ever there were one. Perhaps we need an awkward and difficult term, seemingly itself at war with natural language, if we're to aptly designate the devil's absurd and contradictory reality. Now, one specific question which we might yet entertain is this. Is the devil a person? Ought we to speak of personal evil in speaking about the devil and all his works? In one sense, I have no objection to such talk. 
When we say that the devil is a person, this is, of course, no less a metaphor, an improper but useful predication that helps us to express something of the reality in question, than when we say the devil is a serpent, or a dragon, or a prince, or a liar. In the case of person, the term, as a metaphor, might help to pick out something, perhaps something about the seemingly intentional quality of diabolical resistance to God's ways and works, or perhaps to gesture at a kind of stability, put that in quotes, or a discernible pattern in its outworking, or perhaps again to point to something like the identity which is worked out over time, as it were, in, in this history of antagonism, in this history of antagonistic work. So far, so fine. If we use the word person for, for, for those purposes, no fault, no foul. But pushed, for, pushed further, we might balk, I think, at extending personhood to the devil in any of the more careful and technical ways the term is sometimes deployed as a term of art, either in contemporary theology proper, in the doctrine of God, or in our theological anthropology. In the fifth lecture, I cited David Ford's judgment that in the fourth gospel, the devil never properly becomes a character in the story. The question we are asking pressed into the reasons why that might be so. Why can't the devil ever really appear as a full-blown character in the story? Ironically, the devil is perhaps at his most personal when he is, if I can say it this way, the least himself, which is to say, as and when he becomes paradoxically identical with the figures of Peter and Judas in their intimate betrayals, as and when he is closest to the true person of Christ, in other words. We also noted at various points how Satan and devil, these terms, could pick out something legion, uh, what one theologian calls a colossal coalition of antipathy. That's a great phrase, a colossal coalition of antipathy and opposition to the movements of grace in the world. Now, further reflection might develop in a variety of ways. We might, for example, pursue the idea, with apologies to Melanchthon, that to know the devil is to know his deficits, meaning thereby that there is nothing substantive behind the operations of the devil, that his reality just is, his maleficium, as they say, the devilish being being exhausted in malevolent doing. Maybe, like the figure in the line drawing by Rembrandt used in the promotion of the lectures, the devil is an entirely transient reality, just briefly person-like, sketchily emerging just only for a moment, only when actually in act, in opposition, in antagonism, and then dissolving again. This might comport with the kinds of claims that I made a moment ago. But another idea, which we could pursue, would be to construe the devil as a uniquely anti-personal reality, as, for example, does Robert Jensen, remarking how the devil is, as he puts it, a sort of negative mere image person. He is a parasite person, personal only in the passion of his refusal to be a person, typical Jensen flair. Or, again, uh, as um, you, you, Joseph Ratzinger uh, does when he claims that the devil, in his phrase, is an unperson, an unperson, the disintegration and collapse of personhood itself. Perhaps an even looser account of devilish being might be apt. We might, for example, find something in the suggestion of the novelist David Adams Richards, who I cited at the outset of these lectures for other reasons, that Satan is a powerful, in his phrase, condition, a condition, a condition we come against, at once nebulous, profound, frightening, but in all cases, a condition resolved to destroy faith. If we thought like this, we might hear an echo of the old idea of human captivity to sin as a condition, a comprehensive vitium, as it was called, a powerful corruption baked into our circumstances, which vitiates our capacity for faith and obedience for love and for honesty. The idea of the devil as an aggressively vitiating condition, inimical to God and to God's creatures, is, to, to, to my mind, rather compelling, if not entirely charming. In, in any case, all of these lines of thinking would rightly make refusing the devil personhood, whether as more than personal or less than personal or anti-personal, part of what's required by faithful disbelief here. So I think we have a range of possible possibilities with respect to the personhood of the devil. You, we can all think about reasons why we might be inclined to take one of those routes or, or another or perhaps combine them in some kind of way. Okay, section four. 
disciples before the enemy of Jesus Christ par excellence. Um, throughout these lectures, we've been interested, uh, alongside other things, in gesturing towards ways in which the fresh reflection upon the devil of the sort ventured here might bear upon the Christian life. Does the devil have a place in our doctrine of the Christian life, we might ask. There is much that could be said here, but I restrict myself to two themes only, sort of indications of the kinds of things that might follow. The first thing is the question of living under providence, and the second thing is the theme of resistance. So first, living under providence. When dogmatic interest falls heavily upon the providential superintendence of the devil as a matter of securing concerns in the first article, as we saw was the majority report in the tradition, it funds strategies of Christian living that are resilient and supremely stoical in the face of evil. Because, why? Because they take the long view, as it were. They invest in the power of the benevolence of God finally to put even the most, the most devilishly permitted evil to, to good ends. When we prioritize salvation from the second article over providence from the first as a referential framework for the devil, though, it allows the logic of the former, salvation, now to control and to administer the logic of the latter, providence. In this soteriological reframing, the devil is, as we've shown, primary, primarily the adversary, the adversary of God's saving purposes and the object of divine repudiation and divine denial and divine defeat in the work of salvation itself. If we draw some of the concepts of providence for forward now into this soteriological framework, I think their meaning and force are changed, perhaps in an interesting and important ways. So when the logic of providence is ordered under the logic of salvation, then perhaps uh, the classical talk of divine permission of evil comes to look less like a cool intellectual strategy for ensuring that God is not the author of evil, but instead invites being understood as the purposeful divine patience in attack something tactical, a kind of enigmatic gambit in a campaign of saving grace. That's where we find ourselves, in that kind of space. Similarly, the providential superintendence of evil by God might not be something affirmed now coolly in the third person, but rather something acknowledged to be taking concrete shape in its active resistance and repudiation in and by the saving work of Christ and the ongoing witness of the Spirit. Such shifts construe our place in the confrontation of God and evil differently, and therefore they orient us toward it differently. Providence, the arc of history that bends even evil towards justice, is long, and eschatologically so. Only in the eschaton is the providential governance of evil to be fully and explicitly identical with the triumph of the saving lordship of Christ. In the meantime, we have options. Shall we live in the face of evil primarily with patience in inscrutable providence? Or shall we join ourselves with the salutary impatience of God displayed in the work of the Redeemer? One might feel that the latter, aligning ourselves with the salutary impatience of God that is the work of redemption in the face of evil, that that is enjoined upon us as a matter of faith in the gospel in a way that the former, the stoical patience of, of um, eschatological pro pro providence is not. In the time before providence and salvation manifestly align, in the time of what Paul Ricoeur styled the broken dialectic of Christian life and faith, there is but the way of concrete discernment and struggle, informed by the gospel and its entailments, faith's own agon, struggle against the enmity of the devil and all his works, not as a solution for that, as we have seen, is God's own business, but as a free and grateful response to Christ's invitation to become co-belligerents with him. And we we'll talk of co belligerence on to resistance. Uh, Rowan Williams once remarked that, to some extent, the preaching of Jesus as Lord is a kind of parabolic drama. This is what has happened, and you must discover where you now stand. An account of the saving lordship of Jesus, in which the devil is firmly ingredient, is, of course, a rehearsal of the drama of the gospel. It's a dogmatic retelling of what happened. Heard as such, it can and should decisively inform our discerning just where we stand, and so also who we are and what we might do. Christian life is lived out between, to take some words from Shakespeare, the fell incensed points of mighty opposites. 
Now, we have set out brief remarks about the Christian life in the, all the preceding le- lectures under the single imperative rubric, resist the devil and he will flee from you. You can take it from James, you can take it from First Peter. It's, it's there in both places. Resist the devil and he will flee. I've suggested that the substance of the Lord's Prayer, as well as our practices of baptism and the Lord's Supper and scriptural interpretation and proclamation, take on a new and concrete significance within the agonistic account of salvation that our thinking about the devil has tried to set out. This is premised on the idea that God does not contend with evil without affording beloved creatures and covenant partners a share in the contention as co-belligerents. Again, as one of our poets puts it, to submit to God, we must resist the devil. To obey the laws of heaven, we must transgress the laws of hell. To be governed by divine predestination, we must reject our natural fate as sinners. Resistance, then, is, we might say, analytic in faithfulness, in discipleship, the concrete form of vital faithfulness, the form that it will take uh, in the still yet unredeemed world. More specifically still, aspects of the Christian life can be coordinated with specific modes of Christ's own saving confrontation to diabolical temptation, to the overthrow of demonic possession, and to the outbidding of devilish lies and betrayal. This concrete connection, I think, is what recommends to us the concept of resistance. If we were to think of the Christian life as a parabolic life, which is to say, a life whose willing and doing can and should provide so many everyday parables of the gospel, then we might faithfully imagine Christian acts as concrete parables of resistance to the devil and all his works. We can ask about the shape of human life, caught up in Christ's saving confrontation and struggle with the devil and all his activity. We can ask about ways of being in the world that testify to Jesus' fidelity to his messianic vocation in the face of devilish temptation. We can ask about ways of being in the world that testify to his powerful repossession of depleted lives from death's occupation. We can ask about ways of being in the world that might testify to his vindication of divine truth amidst betrayal and dissimulation. We can, in other words, ask about the kinds of human actions and passions and ways of being that would concretely resist the devil by, for example, resolutely refusing to disavow God's path of self-humbling for us as the way, owning that, joyfully celebrating the dispossession of false and inhuman lordships by the life, or honestly confessing both faith and sin in holding true and keeping faith with the one who is the truth. Resisting despair in the face of evil, Christian lives must pray for, rely on, hope upon, trust in that deliverance from the devil which only God can work, what we've called here several times now the great exorcism of the gospel of redemption, but to which we can in our all too human way even now correspond with our witness and our service. Of course, we cannot overdetermine these matters in, in advance in our dogmatics, for they belong most properly to the living endeavor of faith and life, of preaching, teaching, discipleship, service, in the ever-changing circumstances of our lives and the lives of our c- communities. They are the stuff of discernment and adventure, and so also of risk, and therefore also of repentance. But our doctrine can and should dispose and orient us exactly in this adventure. Section three, final questions, some affordances, and thanks. In the first lecture, I recall the program of Michael Velker's New Biblical Theology and its ambition to reshape fundamental theological concepts long, as he put it, dulled by multiple accommodations to prevailing habits of thought. Perhaps these lectures have, in their own way, done something to resharpen the concept of the devil just a little and so to afford us a newly honed tool in our theological toolkits. Perhaps one we didn't know we needed, perhaps one you still don't really want. Alert to the affordances of our doctrines. We must be on guard here, of course, against the irresponsible demonizing rhetoric by which political controversy and social disagreement can quickly be polarized and political opponents and social groups dehumanized, even in times such as these, or perhaps especially in times such as these. Of course, to the extent that the talk of the devil in Christian life and faith should prove, in fact, to be nothing but the working out of our resentment 
the projection of our wish fulfillments or means for mystifying the inhuman machinations of social or economic or political powers, then Christian theology can and ought to have none of it. If Elaine Pagel's ideological social history of the devil or Daniel Defoe's older political history of the devil should turn out to be the only true and effective story of the devil there is, should talk of the devil prove to be a rather overwrought way of saying boo to things that really displease us a whole lot, then Christian theology can and should have none of it. But part of the wager of these lectures has been that taking explicit responsibility for the devil in our theology affords us the best possibility of resisting weaponization of the figure of the devil in the service of other ends, whether those ends are pernicious, irresponsible, or simply unthinking. Pursuit of a properly evangelical doctrine that, that is to say, a gospel of the devil determined by, sorry, uh, an account of the devil determined by the gospel affords Christian theology invaluable self-critical purchase upon our misuses and abuses of the discourse of the devil. Even so, as we've noted, in the end, all our moral and dogmatic principles and tools will not as such carry us victorious in this particular struggle. We should expect to find ourselves disoriented in the fog of this particular war, to find ourselves outflanked, overrun, and obliged time and time again to acknowledge the immensity and the virulence and the obscurity of evil and our entanglement and complicity with it. Such discernment and confession require that the Christian struggle with the devil, both intellectual and practical, dogmatic and ethical, begin and end in humility and in repentance and therefore also in prayer. I hope these few reflections on the figure of the devil as a topic in Reformed, Christologic, uh, Reformed Christian doctrine may have convinced us of the value of tarrying with this negative just a little. Thinking about the Christian faith and theology as something worked out amidst the agon of Christ and the adversary. Perhaps we now have a way of hearing the martial idiom of the New Testament witness as good and important news again, which is to say as a meaningful redescription of our actual world one that affords some necessary purchase upon it, which otherwise we would not have. As one eminent Scottish divine once wrote, it is no use in a day when spirit forces of passionate evil have been unleashed upon the earth and when fierce emotions are tearing the world apart, it is no use to have a milk and water passionless theology. The thrust of the demonic has to be met with the fire of the divine. And he continues, and indeed it can be, since Christ has overcome the world. Thank you then for your attention, for your patience in my attempt in these lectures to try to think about God's adversary and ours in a way that I hope might have been illumined just a little by the light of that same divine fire. Thank you. Top of the hour, shall we? Still head for the th right. So we have we have some time still. still we, yes, I'm I'm still standing. I'll just lean if that's okay. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, questions, comments, reactions, uh, retractions, corrections. It's all to play for on the last night. So. Yeah. I have an exegetical question. So sure. you, you talked a little bit about the Book of Job, right? Yeah. I can't remember the name of the book, but it's Satan: How God's Executioner Became Something. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like, Great book, and uh, the author makes the argument that the Satan is not just an enemy, but is an, specifically an executioner. And you see this yeah. happen in, uh, I think it's Numbers uh, with, with Balaam, yeah. right? Is it Numbers 20, uh, 22? Mm -hmm. You see this happen in uh, the Book of Kings. And so uh, the author attempts to make this case that it's, it's not just an enemy, it's an executioner. Uh, would you agree with the author? Or would you disagree with the author? Yeah. That's an interesting reading. I am. Um... What I guess I. I'd like to suggest, and I'd be interested, of course, to hear what people think of the suggestion is, I'm, I'm less and less convinced that, that the actual discourse of the Satan in the Old Testament is the relevant precursor to the New Testament doctrine that I've been trying to set out. I think the relevant precursor is the Exodus, right? I think the, rel the relevant precursor is the three-agent drama of salvation that is the heart of Israel's faith and constitution, right? That three-agent drama, right, a drama of redemption, that is the pattern of the three-agent drama of redemption, which we meet on the pages of the New Testament as well. Right? If you want to understand the form of the three-agent drama in the New Testament, that's where I think our Old Testamental sort of eyes and ears might, might best go. Right? I think we learn more from attending to that, that 
Um, that drama, its grammar, its shape, its pattern, its implications, right? its resonations or its resonance throughout the rest of the Old Testament scriptures. I think we learn more about the devil in that way. That sounds counterintuitive even as I say it, but I still think it's true. I think we learn more about the devil and the role of the devil in, the, in, in, in New Testament faith by paying attention to that threefold drama than we do by hunting down the three or four specific citations of the Haas, Satan, and even, uh, I, I'm happy to own it as a hypothesis, even perhaps um, the, the, the discourse of the book of Job t t taken as such, right? Of course, we learn things from the book of Job taken as such, but, but whether we learn much about the devil and the quality of Christ's confrontation with, with the devil as we meet it in, in the gospels from that book, I'm not so sure. Right? We had a discussion this afternoon about whether one of the places in that book where we might actually meet something of the devil is in the discourse of, the, of Job's friends, right? the ones who can rationalize his suffering inside a kind of uh, lock, lock, stock and barrel account of divine providence, which they know a lot about uh, and which they can bring to visit upon him in ways which are strictly and speaking deeply unedifying. Right? That sounds to me more like like the kind of thing that we were discussing this afternoon, right? The, the, the modality of, divine, of, of devilish falsification, right? Something that looks a bit like divine instruction, but actually turns out to be a contradiction of the gospel, right? So not to say there aren't things to learn from Job, but, but I'm not sure that we learn much about the, the, the figure of the devil as we meet it in the pages of the New Testament. I think it, one thing that this, this research has really struck me with is just how deep that difference is, right? Those kind of books, they're, they're motivated by that difference, right? <laughs> you, you, you see the way that the language of the Hasatan appears in the Old Testament, and you see it in the New Testament, and you go, how do we get from here to here, right? I'm not sure that's my question anymore, right? I think my question is, is um, how did we not notice that the, the that the outworking of the redemption of Exodus is a three-agent drama, which is the fundamental grammar of, of the defeat of Satan in the new. How did I not see that ages ago myself? Right? You, you all saw it, I'm sure, but how did I not see that? Right? And if that's true, then it does suggest that perhaps um, if we're trying to, to widen out our, the scriptural basis for our thinking about the devil, which is something we, 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 we might all be ambitious to want to do, we might actually do work trying to work out the pharaoh devil typology, right? That, that might be a particular piece of work that we might want to start with, right? How, what kind of typology is that? How far can it be pressed? What does it give us? What does it not give us, right? What are the limits of the typology? Types aren't, types aren't exhaustive. They illumine certain things and not others. But this type seems real and firm to me, and surprisingly so. Right? Plus, the Belgic Confession says it's there, so it's got to be there, right? <laughs> J just on Reformed confessional grounds. So yeah, so that, that's, been a, that's been a discovery for me. Um, I don't think I had that thought before I before I started this out, and I was spent a lot of time hunting the connections between the Hasatan and the you've got a whole library, right? Uh, like I said, my wife calls it Satan's own library, right? But this collection of books, which includes that one, where the hunt is to try to figure out how we got from X to Y, right? I'm not sure anymore that theologically that's the most interesting. Of course, it's interesting historically. There's all kinds of questions to be asked and answered there, but I'm not sure it's the most kind of doctrinally press, uh, pressing you know, question to ask anymore. Yeah. So, but thank you for the question. It's super. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Thank you. Um, thank you again for all these lectures. Moving from lecture to lecture, um, I have a question that could be dismissed as kind of a U.S. American plea for concreteness and an example. But I, I think I'd like to put the question this way: I would think that being co-belligerent with God and grace, and uh, and with the, the resistance that accompanies that or the consequence of it, that there would also be an agonism in both of those that would provoke one to, uh, to dare reflection on contemporary world sites that need to be engaged. Mm -hmm. And as I hear you, there have been a uh, few references to what might be called readings of the signs of the times. Uh, I, I'm not asking you to do that. I understand that you, you see a lot of that as part of the adventure of faith to be worked out. Yep. But um, it would seem that to take seriously the co-belligerence at these times and the resistance, that you might give us at least an example of where disciples pursuing this mode might be at work right. today. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to resist that all the way down to the end, I'm afraid. Not, not because I couldn't give you one, but, but because I don't, I, I'm not sure that, the that any example I, I would give would 
it might be well it might distract more than it than than it would illumine what i what i'd rather we hear about the form of that co-belligerency which is that if we think about the devil precisely in, in the way that I've tried to structure it here as the, as the opponent of Christ, we take the form of God's own belligerency, if I could talk about like God's own polemus, against the adversary as Christologically determined, then one of the things which, we, which will shape our discernment of those things, our way of being a co-belligerent, is that, is that those, that way of being a co-belligerent will be, strictly speaking, uh, uh, undertaken in correspondence with the mode of Christ's own belligerency. Right? So think about what that might mean. Right? Um, think about what, what, what the form of Christ's f f f fidelity to, the, to his messianic vocation looks like. Right? It looks like what a life of self-giving for, for those to whom he came, right? a life which culminates uh, in the cross. Um, and that, there's, that, that form becomes illuminating for the form of our co-belligerency. Right? The language of co-belligerency, like all theological language, can kind of be cut off and float free. Right? If it floats free, it picks up all kinds of barnacles of other ideas and rationalities. We want to try to keep it true to the Christological determination. You've got to keep it anchored there. And so the form of our co-belligerency is going to, will be aligned with that messianic form of divine and human self-giving. Or again, uh, you know, the, the work of, of exorcism, repossession, uh, the dispossession of, of, uh, of the adversary, the repossession of life for the sake of new life, right? Our, whatever our concrete form of, of co belligerency will look like, it'll look something like that, right? It'll look like something which, which, which intervenes into situations where life is, is, is organized, where we see it organized by the power of death to break that open for the sake of something new, right? These are, I, I, I guess I'm trying to keep uh, these descriptions at the level of what in, a, what in one idiom we might call kind of second order grammar, right? Um, uh, precisely because I think that's, I'd like to, I'd like us to feel the force of that ordering in, in our discernment, right? Um, and not to get ahead of it, right? but to let that, let that grammar kind of orient us and dispose us in certain kinds of ways, to ask certain kinds of questions, and so on. Yeah, that's that. That'll be deeply disappointing to you, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, uh, and should be. But I would be interested, of course, in in people venturing the kinds of disturbance which I think this calls for, right? Um, you know, some of you will preach on Sunday, right? Um, some of you preached last Sunday, right? Where John 12 was the text. You spoke about the ruler of this age being cast out, right? What did you mean, right? What, what did that look like for the congregation you preached to? Did you have a sense of what that was about, right? Well, maybe some of this might help get some traction on those, the, the next time that text comes around or, or what have you. Um, not, not because this reading gives you answers to that, but, but because it gives you binding forms of thought. Yeah. Uh, and not just forms of thought, but also kind of forms of, uh, kind of a grammar of action, if I can put it like that, a, a grammar of action. Yeah. Um, thank you. Sorry. That, I, again, as I say, that'll be disappointing. Okay. Thanks. Good. Good. We probably have time for a couple. Let, let's go here and then to Eric. Yeah. Please go ahead. It has to do with the Protestant notion of vocation, uh -huh. uh, the theology of vocation, and how um, that might fit into your framework of putting providence under soteriology. Um, I, I'm particularly wondering, because you talked about this agonism, um, is the Christian life, is a Christian's vocation solely defined by this agonism? and? And what does it mean for it to be governed by providence? I guess that's my question. Okay. Um, so I think you could give a pretty wide-ranging account of the Christian life that was governed by this fundamental grammar of agonism, right? I mean, and I tried to intimate some of the things that that might mean and look like here. Right? Um, of course, this this construal of the gospel isn't the only one uh, available to us, right? And so it might be that we want to supplement this with other construals of the gospel that have other uh, master metaphors, right, or controlling metaphors. Um, there might be other ways in which which different aspects of the Christian life are brought out by other kinds of emphases. But so you, you can take this at a minimum as a kind of corrective, right, in a way of thinking about the Christian life in which this is almost entirely dropped out. As I kind of read my own Reformed tradition, what might it look like to put it back in, right? And what what kind of pressure might that put on us to change the way we think about certain things? So that's that kind of at a minimum. So I don't want to deny the possibility, in fact, I'd be keen to affirm it, that there are other, other accounts of the Christian life, other construals of the, of, of the Christian life that, that, that would be both legitimate and, um, uh, and uh, 
perhaps even crucially helpful. Suppose what I'm asking here is, whatever those accounts might be, um, to what extent do they, by their own kind of working out, capture and do justice to this kind of things that this account captures and tries to bring out in its own, with, with its own focus? Right? Um, and to the extent that they, they do or don't um, uh, express what's also been brought out here, you know, do, do they require a kind of agonistic supplement right? or kind of ag agonistic modulation? Right? Um, and again, uh, seen as a kind of intervention or a correction to a, to a tradition which has downplayed this a little bit, um, I'd like to think that that's probably true. Right? Um, the, the question about providence is one that I, I guess I tried to, to, to address a little, probably uh, far too hastily here. Um, I, I want to pull, well, so here's my big thought. Um, uh, your thesis will solve it all, but the big, but my, my, my big thought is something like this. Um, doctrine of providence, uh, uh, in, in a sense, like the doctrine of the devil, has an extraordinary degree of autonomy from our thinking about Christ and salvation, right? Floats free in all kinds of interesting ways from, from Christological determination and soteriological gravitas. And that, that gives it a kind of, often a kind of autonomous logic of its own, right? In which we can construe the whole Christian life, including notions like vocation and other things. What I suggested here is that um, we might do well to drag that doctrine back into contact with the, 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 the kind of account of the second article which I worked out here. And if we did that, we might have to change the way we think about some of the categories. Like, what, what does a category like divine permission mean when it's not now a kind of way of accounting for the non or the, the non origination of evil in God, but actually a, a, a description of a mode of divine patience that's part of a strategy of redemption? Does that change our way of thinking about it? I would think it might, right? Um, what if we were to think, if we were to ask ourselves in, in our kind of action in the world at the minute, um, on Monday morning, should I a uh, act in accordance with with my with my own sort of deep patience on the long eschatological arc of providence, which I understand to, to be divine, or should I align myself with the divine impatience towards evil in the world expressed by the work of the redeemer? I might think the second, right? And I might think what that might change the way that I act in the world um, one day, and maybe also on Tuesday, and maybe other days as well, right? So yeah, I I see there. I mean, ultimately, of course, you don't want you wouldn't want to play off your 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 doctrine of um, providence, your doctrine of s salvation. You know, you've got to see them fit together in certain kinds of ways. I, what I guess I'm picking up here is that even as the, as as we explored the way that the doctrine of the devil kind of floated free of soteriology in interesting ways, I think the doctrine of providence in its own way has this history of floating free from from the same center of gravity. And so the, the thinking here is like just what that might mean to pull it back into contact. I think it changes the kinds of questions we ask about what we're supposed to be about. You know. Yeah, thanks for that. Let's let's get the one from online, and then perhaps we'll go to Eric, and we'll see where where we are. Yeah. Yeah, we have a question from Morgan Bell. Thanks for your fabulous lectures, Professor. In the last lecture, you spoke of parentage as a Johannian trope used to describe humans who have become conscripted to the Satan and all his lies. In light of your concern to specify diabology, Christologically and soteriologically, can you speak to how that does or does not shed light? on the role of grace adoption in Christ and salvation. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Morgan. Um, calling in from Canada, I believe, too. Um, yeah, so um, the contrast um, would, would, be work, would be well worked out, right? I, I mentioned uh, in thinking about the language of the Heidelberg um, Catechism itself, with its main, you know, its kind of main recurrent drumbeat theme that Christians are ones who belong to Christ, belong to Christ, right? Kind of possessed, right? Um, adopted, possessed, belong. Um, that's clearly set in contrast, right? Uh, to belong to Christ is to cease to belong to another, use the language of Lordship here, another Lord, right? Um, or to have another God as the one to whom you belong, right? Or, or to, to be at the disposal of, of Christ is not to be at, at, the, at the disposal of another Savior, quote unquote, or another um, uh, 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 controlling power or what have you. So yeah, the language of, of belonging 
and therefore also the extended metaphor of adoption and inclusion and uh, you know the making of a people that is no people that there are a whole kind of there are a whole bunch of idioms aren't there uh, which we could draw out from the from from the gospels the inclusion of the Gentiles into Israel right that 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 picture as well all of those are tropes of what social reintegration was the was the not entirely helpful word I used at some point about possession, right? But the, they're they're all um, they're all tropes about um, the kinds of forms of human co community which reflect the new belonging, right? Which, if you expressed it negatively, is the dispossession, right, of the other kinds of belongings, to, which might well have shaped our our human communities and relations to that point. So yes, of course, the, I think you could. You, you, you could re you could think again about the the meaning of a term of a, a kind of salvation whose center of gravity was say adoption right? Pauline trope um, you might get some particular kind of um, traction on the force of that by thinking about it in a more agonistic way right as a as not just uh, the incorporation of one uh, who, who who was previously not incorporated but the incorporation of one who was uh, b before incorporated uh, as a member of another entity, right? Uh, right, held by another, right? now taken over and held by this one, graciously, uh, and so made children, and so on. So yeah, so that would, I think the possibilities for kind of working out the the um, the implications of, of of making these these kinds of agonistic modes of think, thinking more prominent are manifold, and that, I mean that's that's yeah, just the beginning of a, of a of a possibility there. Shall we take Eric's question, and then we'll see where we are? We've already. Top, the top of the hour or so. Please, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so it's a version of Professor Taylor's question, okay. but way more abstract. Okay. And it's partly, maybe it's the implications for this are not systematic for political theology. Because okay. I hear agonism, parabolic, diabolic, and I can imagine um, this being taken up into account of the relationship between saving history and political history. Mm -hmm. And I, I understand, I, I didn't hear you wanting to assume all theology into soteriology, mm -hmm. but there is a desire to kind of make sure everything is not floating free from this Christological determination. Yeah. So, but you seemed, in an answer to Professor Barreto, at least that I heard online, when he mentioned Empire and Luke, you said, oh, no, 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 I'm talking in a cosmic register, uh, not politics. You admitted there might be something to say there, so this is, what will you say? So. Because I understand classical Protestant reform theology, politics is under providence, not redemption. Yeah. And we can never make legible the work of the spirit in the civil rights movement, in uh, whatever resistance we might have that we are now encouraged to have because we are impatient with God's work. But never confuse that with the story of Israel and Jesus. Um, could you have a more realized eschatology than some kind of, you know, wistful, secular, parable type kind of move or, you know, so kind of yeah. what, what political theology are, are we are we now going to get? Can we have a more missiological political theology? Can we have a, a, a more work of God in politics outside the events of salvation? I mean, you didn't mention many of the Puritans. They're yeah. kind of reformed, but Jonathan Edwards, Cotton Mather, New England has an advocate in heaven, and they were very diabolical in their interpretation of American politics. Sure. Um, but assuming you might be hesitant about that, given some of the other things you said in your first lecture. So give us a political theology in the next you know, two minutes. That <laughs> How does this take up space on Earth? Yeah. So um, one, one, one candidate prospect for, for, for working this out might, might be to see if you could take a take a revision to the to the the classical kind of two kingdoms ish sort of construal of uh, Protestant political thinking that you you appeared to there um, uh, and and run it say into a text like um, Bart's um, civil community and the Christian community or uh, rectification and or sorry um, uh, justice and justice and just justification those those texts I mean Bart's after something there people who know it um, uh, uh, a kind of concentric circles image, isn't it? Is is the one he works with? Kind of Christ in the middle. The church is a community which has a certain kind of knowledge of and relationship to Christ as the Lord, not just of church but also of world. And then the world as a as the kind of unknowing sphere which has Christ as its its center. And the church orientation toward the world is one which is illumined by that structure. Right. I mean, I think you could work that in a 
in in ways that might that you know that could be worked out uh, with some of these themes to kind of draw out the specifics of that uh, that um, a point of contact b b b b between the concentric circle that is the church and the concentric circle which is the world. I mean, the point I, I take Bart's point there to be precisely to take seriously the identity of the God of Providence with the with the identity of the God of Redemption. Right? If you identify the God of Providence with, with with the God of redemption, then then that's why there's a there, there's a center to the concentric circles and not two foci, right? Which have a kind of independent logic. The God of redemption, or sorry, the God of providence is up to something, but our knowledge of the God of redemption d doesn't tell us anything about that, right? You know, you, you describe that in, in in other kinds of kinds of terms. I think Bart's resisting that, right? And I, that I think is I'm congenial with that sort of intuition, and it could be that that some of this idiom might help to work out the consequences of 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 that identification, right? Um, you know, if we draw uh, kind of the doctrine of providence kind of back into contact with our more tightly, um, and one way to do that is to identify. The, the providential God with the with the redeeming God in a way that the tradition has sometimes been reticent to do, or at least to play out the consequences of that. Um, that might change our picture a bit. Yeah, and uh, the concentric circles, or the you know Bart's sort of way of reframing that is, is uh, is 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 a potentially you know kind of fruitful way to do that. There are other thought pictures I'm 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 sure could serve similarly, um, but in all cases it would put pressure. I mean, the, the, and that's that's not unique to thinking about. Uh, um, the kind, this kind of ag more agonistic account of salvation is it? it that, that's that's more a consequence of a kind of uh, recentering of Christian thought in the in the with its center of gravity in the second article, right? And allowing other th other things to orbit around that that um, uh, that center, uh, and then playing out the consequences of of that reorbiting or that sort of rearrangement of the orbital system uh, in our in in this case in our thinking about uh, politics as well. Yeah, sorry. That's a that's a perhaps as abstract an answer as the question you aimed. The question to be abstract too. So yeah, I'll uh, I'll go tit for tat with you with abstraction. So yeah, shall we take one more and then we'll we'll call two. two, two, two. Then do you want? I, I just I guess I have a rather basic question. Um, why might the states have clarifying this theologically? The, the position of the devil in theology be more urgent than clarifying what the position of the devil in the world? Um, and I'm asking a question about stakes. If by your formation, your what you've constructed, the devil does govern the world and does fall upon the possessed, um, which would be the subjects in the world, why might why, why might the stakes of theology um, be more urgent to keep the devil as something that is not reducible to the political um, when the devil's kind of stakes? seems to be um, inextricably linked to its relationship to the world. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I, if, if I take the force of the question uh, all right, I think one of the things that I might say, um, which I hope is, is kind of come across, or I was, was hoping might come across as a sort of um, uh, accumulated point of the lectures as a whole, is that um, the service of the theology, uh, as I understand it here, is... Uh, is to thicken and concretize. I've used Michael Velker's notion of sort of sharpening up a dull tool, right? To kind of work away at that, um, in ex uh, to take an explicitly theolog theological theme to work it in explicitly theological ways, right? And that's a question of trying to to get some some um, uh, some concreteness, some specificity, some contours around the discourse of the devil that we might otherwise lack, right? Um, my Part of my reason for belaboring that in the in, in the program of the lectures is that I think winning that concreteness is the condition of possibility for meaningful discernments about the, the question which you're asking, which is about what 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 does this discourse, what kind of purchase does this discourse give us on redescribing the world that we live in, right? I I think that second move, the redescriptive move, trades on having not an exhaustive or a final, but at least a kind of viable. Uh, a degree of specificity about what we mean when we use the language, right? Or what, what, what theologically, Christianly, evangelically, meaning only of the gospel, what we mean when we use that, use that, use the language. The language itself can mean anything, right? It's um, not anything, but you know, al almost anything. So, um, uh, disciplining Christian speech and thought 
along these lines seems to me the condition of possibility for, for taking Christian responsibility for those kinds of judgments, right? And people are going to make those judgments, right? This is, this is the work of the devil in the world. This activity is one which looks a lot like the kind of activity of the depletion of life to which uh, Christ and us with him ought to be um, uh, um, understood to, 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 to be opponents. Um, th those kind of judgments are exactly the kind of judgments you can venture, but those judgments are ventured uh, better, perhaps, more, more, uh, 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 more adequately, uh, more fully, more faithfully, uh, uh, if um, on, on the basis of being better informed doctrinally. I think the idea that doctrine might, might actually provide us with, uh, with a better grasp of, of, the, of the kinds of language and concepts we, we need to think better about the world is, is not an idea that, 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 we, that we might kind of uh, have embraced or that we might have embraced to the, to the degree that this project imagines we should. Right? And I think the, the wager here is that doing better doctrine, uh, in, and I've tried to give you an example of how I think that doctrine might be done well, or well-ish at least, um, doing be better doctrine actually is done in part in the service of trying to get better traction on judgments of, of discernment and action in the world. But that its, a, it's, a, it's, a ta it's, it's task is exactly uh, uh, in the service of that, and it's not coextensive with those judgments as such. Right? Um, so there's a distinction between first, first and second order here, which I guess I want to police a little. I've been anxious to do that in reaction to, to, uh, to Mark's question and, and others. Um, uh, and yeah, so uh, that, that I think would be the kind, of, the, the kind of imagination I would bring to the question you've asked. Right? That there's a, um, the very condition of possibility of, of a of an adequate act of Christian discernment and judgment, and therefore action, and, uh, and uh, in in the world, uh, it turns on um, winning orientation and insight on the basis of of thinking carefully and concretely about this theme, right? rather than thinking loosely and cavalierly about it, right? or not thinking about it at all, which of course is the more common thing, as I kind of intimated at the outset. And I think we're not served well by the silence. We're also not served well by ill-disciplined discourse about the devil, of which there is a great deal too. So, yeah, I mean, uh, the, uh, if I can make a final reformed point, just while we're um, uh, remembering the, the task of the lectures, um, church discipline is a mark of the reformed church. And I think theology is, whatever else it is, it's a modality of, which, of, of, of church discipline, right? a way in which the, which the church asks and answers the question about its own adequacy to its own center and boundaries, to its own forms and and uh, convictions, right, and and works to try to to renew and to true itself around the center, which is, uh, as I've suggested here, a certain kind of hearing of the gospel. So, uh, if it helps to think of the project as a kind of you know, theological project taken in the service of church discipline, uh, you're, you're welcome to that thought. If that's not helpful, forget I ever said it. <laughs> anyway, thank you for your, for your question. Thank you all for your attendance and your patience. <laughs>